Hi there, I'm Julie. And I'm Adam. And this is a podcast on education and AI. We are still kind of, it's, this is the inaugural podcast, so we're still kind of working through names. Welcome any suggestions that you have. But the purpose of our podcast is, is really twofold. One, we know there's so much happening in AI, and we want to make sure that people have access to curated information. And we also want to make sure that we tie it back to education and uh, really bring in kind of the practitioner's perspective um, on how all this news and how all the things that are happening in AI relate to, to the work that you're doing in school systems. So Adam, tell me what, what kind of brought you to this space? I just remember listening to podcasts about, you know, chat GPT. I think it was Kevin Roos from New York Times. Like we talk about, oh, there's this thing and it can like emulate my writing style by just feeding it some of my, and I was like, that's pretty interesting. And then when chat GPT showed up, I just started, you know, using it. Of course, my first prompt was like, write a Sopranos episode with Seinfeld characters and just got hooked so quickly, but it was because I saw the potential for education. And that was last December. I just looked back through my chats and chat GPT. And ever since then, I've just been pretty much working with school districts on how do we understand the risks and possibilities in a very curious way, but also how do you plan for this? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm super excited about it. How about you? Awesome. Yeah, similar. I have an education background as well. I think Probably the first and foremost, though, what's most interesting to me, I, I'm a parent, so I've got three teenage kids and really invested in, you know, what the future looks like for them. So certainly as a parent, I'm interested and curious. I think as a former world language teacher, I see so many ties to how we're building literacy and fluency around generative AI. And, and that's sort of taking me right back to building literacy and fluency in, in language. And then finally, as a consultant. So Advanced Learning Partnerships, or ALP, is the company that we work for. ALP is a consulting company that works with school districts and state departments of education all across North America. And this is something that is really relevant that schools are navigating both the challenges and opportunities related to generative AI. So certainly invested there as well. But why don't awesome. we get into it? I think, gosh, this weekend was quite the, quite the news weekend relative to open AI. So tell us if you weren't glued to the the TV or the news like we were, tell people what happened. Yeah, so emergency board meeting on Friday. I guess Microsoft found out like a minute before as well. And the board at OpenAI gets rid of Sam Hall. Um, they dismiss him, Sam Brockman. They were moving into a position under the new CEO. And, you know, he quit shortly after that. And there was all this speculation about why. Then comes Sunday and there's news that, you know, they're in open conversations to come back and reinstate him as CEO. And then woke up this morning to find out that him and Brockman are now employees of Microsoft starting their own AI research lab over there. So it's been quite the whirlwind. Um, and I guess most people in education are probably thinking like, why do we care about this at all? Mm -hmm. So Julie, do you have some ideas about why people might hear about this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, first and foremost, OpenAI's mission. So we, we should say, you know, really quickly that uh, OpenAI is is governed by a nonprofit board. So, you know, their mission was really to create AGI that is is positive for humanity. So I think the safety piece is really interesting to me. We don't know what the what caused the breakup or what, you know, why that 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 tension existed. But we have some, I don't know, Adam, you have some theories, so you can share this with us in a second. But I think the safety piece is kind of interesting to me, and I think it's certainly relevant for school systems. So one of the things I think that is absolutely imperative for school systems is that they really be hold vendors accountable and ensure that they are being transparent and accountable with how they're using data, how they're training their models and things like that. So I think that's, you know, this just sort of underscores that. How about for you? Anything else that you think this is definitely a thing that you know, people in the education space need to be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, look, when I'm out talking to folks, I help them understand as, you know, awesome as the technology is, there's risks and possibilities. And that's what kind of falls into this, right? And the reality is that OpenAI has grown very quickly. They're expected to have a billion dollars worth of revenue this year. And as you mentioned, you know, it's set up in a way that really it's not supposed to be like the tech companies we have today where profit is the only thing that drives it. 
However, there is a, a lot of competition from Google and you know, Rapik, and now we'll talk about today, you know, Elon Musk mm -hmm. with Grok. Like there, there's a lot of competition in this world. And so OpenAI has their developers conference last week, the first one, Sam Altman's on stage. We're going to talk a little bit about what they released, but the reality is he doesn't say anything about ChatGPT5. You know, he alludes to it at the end, like this is what we're sharing today is very minimal compared to what the future is going to be, but he's not saying anything. Following, right, he does, and it kind of didn't make a lot of news. He starts talking about GPT-5. And my guess is that that took the board by surprise, mm -hmm. to your point earlier. You know, they're really focused on safety first in this whole AGI conundrum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they probably were like, He's not being transparent. He's not sharing. He's out telling the world about GPT-5. We don't know enough about this. And that's what created this and why it escalated so quickly. So, you know, from an educator's perspective, there's some things to watch. Like where a lot of us are using GPT right now, ChatGPT, because it's the best thing out there. It's being built into a lot of Microsoft resources as well. A lot of people use that. So with all these changes, if a lot of people leave, you can see a degradation in innovation and in the ability for them to deliver, you know, the experience we have today, but we can also see, you know, Microsoft shift gears and start building, you know, something of their own. And that could obviously have a huge impact on education. Sure. But I do like the fact that the conversation is centered around safety, right? And transparency, because that is something that, you know, we need to keep in front of educators forward yeah. in this general AI world. So. Yeah, for sure. The other thing I wonder about is, you know, Silicon Valley is sort of famous for when these splits happen, then all of a sudden that's spawning like a whole bunch of other startups and, and companies and things like that. So the other thing I wonder about for people in the education space is just tools to evaluate, you know, the benefits of, of different, you know, vendors and what come, what's going to come at them in the ed tech space as an outcome of this, you know? That's, well, that's, I, I think we should just hold on for dear life on the one and see what happens next. But clearly Microsoft has made a big move here. So we'll see how this turns out. Yeah. Well, reporting on it though, for sure. Sounds good. All right. So even though that sort of dominated the news for the last 48 hours, there are some other things that kind of happened in the last week or so that definitely have some implications for educators. So you want to kick us off and talk about a couple of those? Yeah. So I kind of alluded to this in the other segment, but OpenAI did have their first developers conference. And they released a lot of, of really cool stuff, but I think the most interesting thing was this thing called GPTs and it's this ability essentially for you to use natural language processing. It basically means you don't have to code, you just type and you can upload your own documents, your own resources. Then you can create a little app that can be shared out to do lots of different things. I'll share a couple of examples that we're working on. <laughs> But they're also going to have a store around this. So kind of think of, you know, the Apple the iTunes store, you'd have a similar store for your, for your GPTs. So I got pretty excited about this. You and I had been working on a rubric for teachers so that they would know how to label assignments. And so I started building a GPT for that. I can tell you the process has been interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't get it to ask one question at a time yet. Start <laughs> working on that. But I think that instead of, you know, in the past, I would have just tried to create a prompt that I shared. I think this is a much better way for us to share things like this. Mm -hmm. I also created one so that if you wanted to train it on your own voice to write things, whether it's emails or articles or blog posts or letters, you can do that pretty quickly as well. That one seems to be working a little bit better. But the reality is, you know, now we have to figure out how do we explain to people that when do you use a GPT and when do you just use a, a plain old, like, I know you were messing around with it too. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I was. So I have a couple of, of wonders about that. So one, I think the monetization piece is kind of interesting. At first I was thinking about monetization for school systems, but now I'm thinking about monetization for students and what the implications are if students can monetize GPTs on just the purpose of education. And, and, you know, so I think there are going to be some interesting conversations we can have as an outcome of that to see where that goes. Sort of like YouTubers on steroids. So that, that could be interesting. I think the other thing that's interesting to me about the GPT piece is just in the learning space, you know, we took a, a pretty static document that I think was usable as a rubric and turned it into an interactive experience. And 
or you did through the, the creation of that GPT. And so I think there are going to be some interesting implications on professional learning and sort of, you know, micro learning opportunities in that space as well. Yeah, I agree. I hadn't thought of a student angle, but yeah, you're right. Well, a couple of other things that came out of that day was that they also released Chat GPT four Turbo, mm-hmm. which gives you 108, 128,000 context parameters. And if some of the other announce, um, they had what's called GPT four Turbo announced, which has 128,000 context window. That basically means you can have 300 pages of chat. Whereas before we were under a hundred pages of chat going back and forth. So you could keep a chat going for a much longer mm. period of time. And then they also released another really cool thing, which is multimodal. So before we work in a single loop, right? So you would do one chat that was for data analysis, one chat for Dolly three, one chat for uh, vision. Now you can do all of that in one single chat. So you could actually bring in documents, right? You could bring in images, you can bring in, you could have it create images all in one chat now, which is pretty awesome. So, you know, this is also being built into the stuff at Microsoft as well, which we'll talk about. So, uh, you know, those announcements are very helpful, but they're all part of GPT-4. And what I'm learning as I'm working in school districts is that most people are still using 3.5. And they're not upgrading to the $20. I'm not advocating that, you know, we give every teacher a 4.0 right now. But I am suggesting, especially at the district leadership level, if you're going to get interested in this, that we really should be on 4.0 so they can see the power of some of this. Yeah, for sure. I think that cost piece is going to be really interesting. So it's also interesting with the three big players that are involved in in the, the generative AI space right now. So Google Bard just announced that they are turning on this, they're making it available for teens. They've got some interesting fact-checking pieces in place where it automatically, if somebody asks a, a factual question, it double checks it before it gives uh, the response. They released, there's like an AI literacy guide that kind of builds some, some education around AI. And then also they, they have this like math feature where you can put in any problem and it will kind of help you guide you through the solving that problem without giving you the answer. But it's free and they, they you know, versus the, the sub- sub- subscription you might need to pay for ChatGPT for. Even Khan Academy, right, with Khan, Khan Migo, they announced a, like a reduction by half of their cost to school systems and some new features as well. So I think it will be really interesting to see what school systems end up purchasing and how that cost plays out in terms of competition. Yeah. I mean, it's worth to suggest here that you can all of the, many of the 4.0 experiences through being what was called Bing chat. It's now called Copilot through Microsoft and that's free. So, you know, it's probably worth it to help people understand that as Mm -hmm. well as we kind of get into this, but since you mentioned Google, maybe we should stay on that train for a second yeah. and then we could get this some Microsoft updates. And then I know we had this common sense media thing we went by, but we got a lot to talk about. So <laughs> a lot of things on the Google side that I thought were interesting in the past week was that first of all, Google is now going to invest in character.ai, which if you don't know what that is, that's just the ability to chat with like historical figures and or, you know, living people. So Abraham Lincoln to Elon Musk. But the research has showed essentially that people spend more time on the character AI site than any other generative AI tools. And it's probably like 18 to 24 year olds are spending more time here. However, it looks like Google's going to invest in that. So it's definitely a, a tool to watch. Mm-hmm. I've messed around with it a little bit and I find it kind of amusing. You can also like chat with Mario from Super <laughs> Mario. So if you haven't picked it out. Obviously, the educational context for that, if we can get this right and do it in a way that's safe for kids, we can have kids having conversations with, you know, Julius Caesar and you know, other folks from history that might be history and or inventors or um, scientists, all sorts of folks we can bring into the curriculum. So stay tuned on that. Hopefully, they'll make an education version of that. And then the other one that was interesting is, have you heard a Google Dream Track? I've not. No, I saw I saw that on your sheet, but I haven't. I've haven't heard of that. Say more about it. When Dream Track, they took like I don't know five or six artists they've started with. One of them is Charlie. Pooks. The other one is John Legend is one of them. And what you could do is you can create a thirty second song, 
but you, you go in there, you just say, I want a song about breakups and then you choose the artist and then it generates a song and sings the song for you. It's not open to the public yet, but if you Google it or below, we'll have, we'll have a link so you can see what it's all about. But that was another kind of Google tool that I thought was, you know, kind of interesting as you and I have discussed the the music world is probably the first to jump in to this pretty quickly. And to me, that's going to be a way for artists to monetize. And if you watch the video, it tells you that like the artists will have full control over how their likeness is used. So if they don't like a song that's generated, they can ask them. Interesting. Well, I wonder what that does to democratize opportunity for folks looking to get into the, you know, it's just, it's an interesting evolution of, I, I keep comparing it to YouTube, right? Because anybody who had, you know, was able to, you know, record their themselves, but now so you democratize this. You don't have to have the songwriting capabilities. You don't have to have the permission of being able to, you know, use an artist's song. So there, it's just a really interesting it's a really interesting space. I'll be very curious to see how that develops. And to your point, I saw a tool this weekend. I think Matt Wolf was talking about it where you can just kind of hum the language or make the sound like a drum beat sound. And then you just say, you know, make this into a drum beat and it does it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you don't even have to know how to play the drums <laughs> or the saxophone yeah. or the guitar. You can make the music with your yeah. mouth and make your own music. So there's some really interesting things coming. And again, like, for kids that are sitting in music class today, their world can be completely different. And we, you know, we should be figuring out how do we use these tools appropriately yeah, in that for sure. environment. I also think in terms of going back to implications on some of these things that we're talking about right now on education, I don't think we can underscore enough, like from the professional learning side, just, you know, building exposure to these things and, and letting educators and uh, decision makers start to experiment with these tools and have conversations and really make the space to reflect on how that alters, um, you know, what they're doing on an everyday basis. How about you? What That's other, sure. what else comes to mind in terms of implications for education? Obviously professional learning is one of them, but, but again, like kids are making presentations all the time, right. And they're having to go out a music board or whatever. They can just use these tools. It's integrated in, they can start making their own music, right? Copywriting their own, if they can. Right now, they won't be able to copyright it because the first case said you can't copyright AI-generated stuff, but in the future, maybe they can, right? So it could open yeah. up a whole field, field for these kids. So we should be exposing them to this in a controlled way, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Google. Microsoft had their night conference last week, and that's what I was explaining earlier. The, I mean, everything was co-pilot. They actually even changed the name of Bing Chat to Copilot. And it, essentially what that means is in the release uh, of this stuff last week, like they're building this ability to have chat on top of almost everything across the board. And they also had this really slick looking product called Fabric that allows you to create a data lake with all your data. And then they had this term called lake houses where you could then silo like the two or three data silos that you want to chat on top of and start chatting. And it was like, like the demos were pretty amazing how quickly you can do this and get to really, um, really good outcomes. I'm still trying to figure out my mind, like how do we train these things on education data? Yeah. So when the questions are asked, so we're getting the right outputs, what are the guardrails we need? But I think we're a lot closer as of last week to getting what I call small language models, right? For school districts trained on their data than we were, you know, three weeks ago. So I think Microsoft is really uh, leading the way. I'm interested in seeing what Google does here because clearly they have the technology to do something very similar. So we'll see what their announcements are as well. But if you didn't catch the, the Ignite conference and see the opening keynote from Satya, it was, oh, like, I know, my head was, there were so many announcements at, in this. I was like excited and overwhelmed at the same time. It was pretty paradoxical, but it's just, that's how fast this stuff is moving. I don't know. Did you catch any of it? I didn't. I have all the recordings. So part of my Thanksgiving <laughs> time was going back and, 
and watching a few of those. Yeah, I mean, from an educator standpoint, first of all, you know, being enterprise or co-pilot enterprises. Now, if you have an A3 or an A5 license, your school district already has access to this for adults. So you could be utilizing this right now um, across your school system. Yeah. That's one thing that, you know, educators should be thinking about is how to start using these tools right away. And pretty much most of you already have access. Okay. All right. Let's, let's shift gears here to more and more education focused announcement last week, which was the common sense media scoring rubric. I know you took a look at that. Was your, some of your ideas? Yeah, that was really interesting. So if, if you haven't had a chance to see it, basically they, Common Sense Media released like AI product reviews. So they took several different AI products and then matched, rated them against their eight principles of successful AI. So things like, did they put people first, fairness in their creation, trust, kid safety, learning. So the ability to foster social connection, privacy, and then transparency and accountability. So I thought that was really interesting. So uh, unsurprisingly, if you have been following sort of, you know, the ChatGPT was not, did not rate very highly, but Conmigo did. And so, it, but you can really go in. There's, I, I was kind of surprised by the depth that, that it went into, both in terms of how each of these um, platforms works and then with some of the ratings and descriptions and, and then being able to kind of support their thinking and why they rated it the way they did. So I don't know what, what stuck out to you about it. I'd say a couple of things for me, like they had the normal things that you would have thought would have been there, like a GPT, Bar and Dolly. They don't, they Dolly two, not three, and stable f- diffusion. But I saw things like My AI, Bora, which I've never heard of, Cry on Learning, which I'll come back to that in a second. Toddle AI, Ello, and then as you mentioned, Conmigo was one that I thought they would. So the one that was rated the highest was this Chiron Learning. I had to look it up and never heard of it before. But it was interesting because it's not using generative AI at the center. It's an AI tool, but it's conversational AI. So they essentially said all the, the Q&A in the background that it's just, it's generating based on, you know, what they have kind of programmed into the tool and not just creating stuff more generatively. And they rated that one the highest, which tells you clearly, you know, the, this new wave of generative AI tools still has some, uh, still some work to do you know, according to common sense. That was the first thing that stuck out to me. The second thing was I got pretty curious around like, well, how would open AI or chat GPT rate themselves given the same criteria? So I, I had a little chat with our friend this weekend and I didn't give it the scores at first. I just said, Hey, here's the criteria. How would you rate yourself? And it rated itself. And in, you know, to your point, it rated itself higher than what was from common sense. So then I started to drill down. Then I, I gave it the, I essentially gave it, you know, the language criteria. And then it, you know, compared and contrast. And then I gave it the score. <laughs> and I said, now compare this to your score. And it did. And then I said, well, would you change your score? And the same thing I did in all the, the three areas, which were transparency, safety, and privacy, right? I forget the third area right now, privacy. Yeah. It changed from four to two on all three of those areas and described why. I think for educators, why this is important is because the way that ChatGPT was looking at those areas was very different than the lens that an educator put on those areas. Recognize that by me asking the question, but before that, it had no clue. For those that are kind of using these tools to create rubrics, right? To build things in the areas that are aligned with what common sense is doing, you need to be cognizant of that, that you probably need to feed some of this language in if you want it to be more, you know, a more education just not AI. Yeah. It was interesting to look at how they were trained and it does say that, you know, they were, they're you, a lot of them use different ethical frameworks, but across the board, the privacy piece, even like you talked about, opt-in features, right? And stuff like that, that they just don't make available on a lot of these platforms. Yep. So I'm interested to see the next set of tools and also the evolution. And if any of these companies, you know, take this evaluation seriously. The other thing to note is that even the the description of Bard, it said that it wasn't open to anyone under 18. Mm -hmm which is now not the case, obviously, from what you shared earlier. 
So I wonder now if their rating would be different based on the fact that it is. So I'm sure when they reevaluate, we can look into yeah. that as well. But to your point, the, the teen version is definitely trying to be more of an education tool than just put open AIs. Yeah, for sure. The other thing I wonder about that's not, you know, all these criteria are around how the models were developed. There's not anything around the actual impact of the tool. So, you know, like there used to be a what's work, a what work clearinghouse, right, to evaluate different, different platforms and different software. And I wonder about that as well, if that's a potential next evolution. And I just don't think other people have been using some of these tools long enough to be able to have that data yet. Yeah, I agree. So something to watch for sure. And thank you, Common Sense, for yeah. putting that up yeah. work. Um, all right. I got a couple, of, I got like three quick hitters all for right, you, right? The, the lightning round here. <laughs> so the thing I was reading on LinkedIn, uh, on like six different new research things that came out, but one of them was that they put the current frontier models through those AI plagiarism tools, it turns out that it never catches anything that was created by Claude and Anthropic. And the, and the research ended by saying, and children, students know this. So or right now, kids are finding Claude very quickly because they know that it can't be caught in these tools. So just something for, mm -hmm. for educators to know for sure. But that's the only way they're determining, again, as we've been saying, as we're educating people, that is not the best way to determine if kids are, are cheating or not. So that's one. The second one was, I don't know if you saw, but Elon Musk has released his LLM called Grok. <laughs> and it's got like two modes to it. One is a serious mode and one is obviously a, a fun mode. And it's claim to fame at this point is that it's uh, pretty, pretty sarcastic. And so the reason I bring this up an education context is like, you know, there's going to be a lot of LLMs out there. Yeah. We talk, there was a BARD and ChatGPT, right? And Claude, but now you got Rock, you have what Meta's doing in the open field, right? And so we as educators have to understand that kids are going to find lots of different things and be an influence in lots of different ways. And this notion of digital literacy and helping them understand that is going to be super, super important. 100%. Did you see that news? What did you think about it? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I think, I think the Grok thing is interesting. I, the, the, my worry is that, you know, it's, it's trained on data from Twitter, right? And so I, you know, I think in when we're talking about bias and we're talking about, you know, certain, certain bent, I think that, that worries me a little bit about X and just again goes back to that that idea of, of transparency and accountability and, and really thinking critically about the, like the tools that we're using and how they're trained and who owns them. And I just think that the critical thinking piece is going to be essential for everybody and especially in school systems. All right. I lied. I actually have two more. <laughs> this, one, this one is a right now, the next one is a future thing. But did you see that humane company release that pin? They did. You really want to know about this? You should hit the hard fork podcast yeah. because Casey and Kevin really put this thing through, through the rigor. But the, the bottom line is that it's a first generation technology, but I just don't see just flying off the shelf. You got to pay like 700 bucks and then $29 a, a month to T-Mobile. You really don't can't do much with it that you would do with your phone already. Yeah. However, there is a piece to where you can project like onto your hand. And that piece there, I think that technology there could be interesting moving forward, but I don't think this is the cell phone killer just yet, but I don't know what you thought about it. I think the part that I actually I thought was coolest as a, as a world language teacher was the ability to speak in your native language to anybody, have them receive it in their native language, and then, you know, respond back. So the ability to communicate sort of instantaneously was was really interesting to me. Again, I you know, I think there are, there are platforms that enable you to do that sort of in writing, but the, the, the verbal, you know, ability to do that verbally was really interesting. Yeah. I, I got the chat GPT app. I'll be able to do that Soon. very shortly. Yeah. 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 No, but I, but interesting to see that all that's coming, right? So that the, the wearable technology piece, the privacy implications on that are really staggering to me, but you know, yeah. Yes. And so to your point, from an education perspective, you see a kid show up with one of those in your school. 
be aware that they could just turn something on on their pen and just start recording. Or a parent walks into your office with one of those on. They could be recording you. There's a light that will be on so you can see when it's recording. But outside of that, you know, privacy is definitely going to be an issue moving forward with these things. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting if that holds up in as evidence in a court of law if you haven't I've been asked, you know, haven't asked anybody for permission, but. I mean, but to your point, we'll see what the case, the first case is. And then the last thing I was going to share, which is, I thought was just, it's, it's definitely, definitely future, but it's this new kind of doctor's office idea where the doctor's office of the future. So think of a pod, you walk in and it literally just scans your whole body, does all these tests, and then it sends the information to your doctor. So you no longer have to like make the doctor's appointment if I have the doctor ask you the questions and run the test. You just do it through this pod. Imagine if you had those at schools, kids don't feel well, especially in communities that they don't have access to, to doctors for a number of different reasons. Um, these pods of the future, you could just have me, every school, mm -hmm. kids could definitely get the medical attention that they need a lot quicker. So that I thought was pretty promising, had yeah. an implication for you know, medical and education as well. Yeah, for sure. Definitely an interesting add-on to the community health model, for sure. And we'll link to that video so you can see that as well. So that's the news. I mean, <laughs> look, what a crunch you like to think. And so many implications for education, you know, on top of the fact that we're coming up on Thanksgiving and Christmas and then the, the new year will begin. And I think there's, there's a lot of stuff we're working on with school districts right now. In the planning process, we'll, we'll start operationalizing those plans. So we'll have lots of resources and tools to share. Yeah, for uh, sure. Podcasts, as well as some interviews that we'll do with people who are actually implementing. So I'm looking forward to more and more of these podcasts. I think we have one ask, right? Which is we want to end each session with a questions from you all, the listeners. So please make sure that you write in and ask your questions and we'll share how to do that below and then we'll answer the questions live. And yes. Awesome. All right, Julie, anything you want to say to wrap us up? No, can't wait. Looking forward to questions. Looking forward to, to our next episode and who can't wait to see what the, the next week brings. Crazy. All right. Talk to you soon. See y'all soon. Bye.